Intel taking some shots at Apple. You know, they used to have a relationship. They used to be cool with one another. Yeah. They used to collaborate. Intel used to be, or Apple used to be, one of Intel's big customers. Yeah, good uh, times. Good times. Good yeah. times were had for a number of years, man. Anyway, not the case anymore. It's all about M1 stuff with the Mac and one heck of a chip that they put together. And, uh, you know, Intel's getting pushed from either side. Mm -hmm. They got Apple on one side. They got AMD on the other side. They're in the middle. Some would say they're getting squeezed. It sounds like a short squeeze. <laughs> uh, Intel squeeze? It's not what a short squeeze is at all, but I just, I'm, I'm picturing, I'm envisioning Intel getting squeezed from either side. And so they're trying to come out and say, hey, look, we're still here. Remember us? We're Intel. We yeah. do things. Yeah. And in order to convince people that not only are they still here, but that they should be considered for a person's next computing purchase, they have taken some shots directly at Apple in uh, this recent social media campaign that they've launched. And so here's the first one, the first slide. If you can power a rocket launch and launch Rocket League, you're not on a Mac. Go PC. Oh. Woo Easy Intel. Easy there. A little feisty. <laughs> Who else has tried this? Microsoft has gone at... at I think Samsung as well. Well, Samsung's gone at Apple, yeah. But yeah. Microsoft recently went after Apple with the kid in the video. He has the Surface product. He's like, look, I can just touch my screen. Can't do that over there. Can I touch my screen? No. And actually, that brings me to the next slide that they also shared here, taking another shot. If you can flip through Photoshop thumbnails with your actual thumb, you're not on a Mac. Go PC. Now, that's a shot because of the fact that you can get the touch screen on so many PC devices. Here's the thing. The, the stuff Apple did with the M1, unbelievable, right? Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. To the point where you're seeing, I mean, you read some of the analysis on the thing. Even from people who more traditionally on a PC side can uh, show love when it's due. Show, yeah. show respect when it's due. Sure. When something is well done. Yeah. What is the... Why am I forgetting the phrase? What is that phrase? Um. Credit where credit is due! Damn, Mo from the sideline. Credit where credit is due. And sometimes I feel like you see something like this and it can go both ways. If it is humorous and if it is, if there's a little bit of wit to it, you could be like, ha, all right, go ahead and tell. But on the flip side, it can feel a little bit desperate too. When it's like, you know, Especially if it doesn't just come off as all that funny. No. Like, you could easily do the same one with the Photoshop and be like, the flexibility of a touchscreen. Uh-huh. You know? Do you think this is petty? I was going to ask you the same you question. Microsoft I don't really care. I'm going to be honest. I don't really care that, much. I don't care that much one way or the other. I mean, take your shots. Do what you got to do. Everybody needs to lighten up, I guess, in general. But... I'm just saying as far as selling your product, I don't know that you necessarily want to be drawing the Mac comparison right now. Uh -huh. After you just got boot, like it's more maybe more a timing thing than something than than anything to do with the features they're talking about because they're right. There are some downsides to the Apple product offering, which is I mean well known, touchscreen not going to be there and versatility of ports is not going to be there and gaming's not going to be there. We know these things. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you want to communicate that message? And what should your timing be around uh, communicating that message? Mm. To let people know that, hey, here's what you can do on the Intel side of things. But at the same time, you see Intel is just marketing Go PC in general. And what have we seen recently is the emergence of AMD laptops. We looked at them ourselves. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, so, like I said, man, it's coming from either direction. And then you got John Rettinger. He posts. He got. He did this video for Intel, and he was taking some heat in the comments. I mean, like, look at the ratio over there. Uh, because, well, obviously the M1 fans are in there saying, "How dare you!" Uh -huh. As they would do. But it, it is a point to it. Like, just because I may prefer one thing over the other doesn't mean that there isn't a point to be made that there are positives and negatives there are attributes on either on either side it is a true thing i miss certain things when i move to the macbook and then i miss certain things when i move to the pc it's different flavors you know yeah and there should be healthy competition even if it's just two it's different flavors sure you know i used to eat an ice cream flavor maple walnut oh can't find it anymore no? No, I can't find maple walnut. You can't get uh, maple syrup and just walnuts? Hey, man, I'm not trying to mix my own ice cream Why over not? here. Jeez. DIYs? I got no, I can't imagine, That's the trend imagine now. myself. Imagine uh, the situation. Imagine the countertop, and I've got maple, and I've got ice cream, and my family's looking at me, and I'm mashing it all together like on this. On a cold stone? Yeah, actually, maybe that's exactly what we need in our house. I'm telling you. Been trapped in there for yep. a year or so. Maybe that's exactly what we need. Exactly. DIY ice cream night. Yes. Maple walnut. Yeah. Get everyone involved. I love this idea. It's better than making pizza. Probably less messy, too. Uh-huh. Anyway, so they go and uh, and they put these out there and, they, uh, you know, it, the, the flaming stuff goes back and forth and all the rest of it. Hashtag go PC. It's tough to be Intel right now. That's pretty obvious. They had, like I said, this huge customer goes a different direction, and now they're left having to figure their stuff out. They set up a few specific benchmarks to show where their system could be better, but it's not going to be that simple. There's complexity to this thing, and we're going to have to wait and see how it shakes out. And So what's your verdict? Good look, bad look, these particular tweets. You know, if, uh, if it's funny... I would say it's a good look. Yeah. But I'm but saying, I, is it? I'm saying these I, I, exact ones. Mm, you're not. No, you do not have Willie Do's boat, Intel. But good luck to you. Yeah. Today's sponsor, Honey. You've seen it. You know it, Willie Do. You're familiar. You're browsing the web anyways. Uh -huh. You're shopping anyways. Uh -huh. Where else are you going to shop these days? The internet. That's where you're going to do it. Yes, but absolutely. You, you want to save a few bucks as well because, well, who doesn't? Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Like, you were just telling me you pick up a coffee at McDonald's for a dollar. And oh, I'm yeah. saying to you, it's unbelievable. Uh huh. And so you chase the savings. You're a smart man. Of course. Yeah. You know what happens when you save the money on the purchase? I can invest in stonks. Yeah, you could do something with over. it. Yeah. Whatever you like. You might even uh, get yourself a maple walnut. I well, you know me. I can't eat the nuts. Oh, I apologize. That's maple. So, that's so rude. It's very rude. I got yeah. the guy. He is allergic to the walnuts, and I got him on the walnuts. Walnuts. The what nerd. about almonds? Uh, peanuts. Everything. Yeah, but maple is good. What about can... pistachio? No, I've been missing out. I know. No, no, I'm not. I, not a big deal. <laughs> You're doing great, Will. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we all shop online, and we've all seen that promo code field taunt us at checkout. You know when it shows the promo code? Uh -huh. And you have to go past, and you're like, wait, do I have a promo code? And you're like, no, I don't. What do I, where do I even start with this? And then you have to go through searching it, and because you would want a promo code. Well, it's, it's true. It does kind of taunt you. You're like, am I about to pay full price and no one else is paying full price? Because... Uh -huh. I won't feel like that. Knowing that there's a promo code out there. It's rude. For you. Yeah. It's they're rubbing it in. Yeah. So what does Honey do? Well, they take that part of the process out of it. If there is a promo code box, guess what? They're going to search the web. Honey, the, the, the extension, is going to search the web and instantaneously, automatically try to find the best coupon for that exact promo code field. Mm. So it's all, I mean, you add it straight to Chrome. You're already on the internet. Simple savings over here without any extra effort from you. 
It's a free browser extension. It scours the internet for promo codes and then applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online, ranging from sites that have tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands and even food delivery. Imagine you shopping on your favorite site, saving money, applying coupons without even thinking, and purchasing some extra ice cream or stocks with the leftovers. Or just, or just keeping it there. Because you know what happens when yeah. you don't pay the money? Yeah. When you save the money, you keep the money. Yes. That's your money. Yeah. And In my wallet. You know what my favorite money is? What's my that? money. <laughs> that's my favorite money. Good job. It's the best money that's out yeah. there. <laughs> my own. <laughs> anyway, it's very straightforward. Willie, do you just saved some money yourself using Honey. Yeah. Uh, what I was mean, it you bought? I'm a, I'm a snowboarder. I go snowboarding. Okay. And uh, I went to Burton.com and I bought some stuff. And I use Honey. I saved some bucks. Oh, Willie really yeah. do, ladies and gentlemen. He's teaching you how to do it. And Don't screw good, this up. The good thing is is that uh, it reminds you. So once you go on the checkout, it just pops up. And then you just apply coupons. And then there you go. Listen to this. Honey has found over 17 million members over $2 billion in savings total, including Willie Do and his snowboarding purchase. I'm one of them, yeah. He's one of them. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash lulater. That's joinhoney.com slash lulater. You can also click the link down in the description to get Honey for free and start saving money immediately. Our next sponsor today is Raycon with their everyday true wireless earbuds, which I actually have I actually have right here in the blue coloring. It says the next wave. These wireless earbuds give you the features that you're looking for in a pair of fully wireless earbuds for less money, Willie Do. Yeah. Then you're gonna pay for some of those other brands that are out there. This comes with a 24 hour battery charge case. So 24 hours of battery life with the charge case. Listen for up to six hours on the earbuds themselves. You can take phone calls, of course, like any set of truly wireless earbuds. Easy to pair, premium sound in a compact design. Of course, I don't need to tell you about the benefits of a true wireless earbud, particularly for things like fitness, mm. where you don't want to have any kind of cable dangling or something like this. Mm -hmm. Now, you may have been holding off, moving towards a set of true wireless earbuds because you were scared by the prices, but you don't have to be scared anymore because even, even though these are already more affordable, we've actually got a deal for you today. This is where you put the applause. Yeah. We're going to make it even better for you. How about this? You ready? Raycon is offering 15% off all their products for listeners of Lou Later. Here's all you have to do. Go to buyraycon.com slash later. That's it. You'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. So feel free to grab a pair and a spare. You see, you save a few bucks, you put an extra one in the car, you leave it in the glove compartment. Yeah. Or the center console. Yeah. So then next time you go to the gym, once the gym opens back up, you've got the pair ready to go. That's it. You get 15% off your order. Uh, all you got to do is go to buyraycon.com slash lulater, buyraycon.com slash lulater, or click the link down in the description for 15% off your entire order. Thank you to Raycon. I saw this leak. Insane. An insane leak. The Xiaomi Mi 11 Ultra. Holy moly. Did you see this thing? Yeah. What is going on? Uh, Giant camera module and a screen on the back of the phone. Why not? Which is a mirror of the screen on the inside of the phone. This tiny little screen. <laughs> now, obviously, when you see it in the way that it's pictured here, it makes very little sense. Like, why would you want people on the backside of your phone seeing what you're looking at on your phone? But if you launch into the camera app, and I'm curious how they're going to implement it within the software. Imagine you can tap the little screen. <laughs> Touch screen on the back? Yeah. 
Are you gonna, are you, you're about little, to have a little giggle there, Willie D? That's, uh, yeah, it's uh, quite funny to me. A mini screen, a mini phone. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even think, it looks so small, I don't even know that you could tap those icons individually. I think your right, fingertip yeah. would press multiples if it was even possible. But I presume the purpose of this is for taking photos on your high quality camera on the rear and framing it up through the camera app. But what's weird is in this particular demo, this is a leak, by the way, this guy took the video down It got reposted. It's not supposed to be up yet. He's showing it off with just the camera or the phone's desktop on the back of the phone. So I don't know how that works when you enable it. It's probably inside of the operating system. And he's probably just doing it for the purpose of this video. But it's kind of weird that it would even be possible because I can't imagine why you would ever want to do that. So it's almost like the screen should only activate when you're inside the camera app. Is the video still up? The video got reposted. Oh, did it get taken down in the time? I have, it, this, I have it uh, here embedded. Let oh. me see if it's still up. It's a repost that's up right now. But obviously they don't they don't want it up. Maybe it got pulled from your article. They don't want it up because it's not out yet, but they there are a few specifications that are now uh, have been leaked, including the triple camera setup, 50 megapixel primary sensor, 48 megapixel ultra wide, and a 48 megapixel periscope zoom. So one of the reasons that the module is so big is because there's this insane zoom on there. Uh, you know how Samsung has the 100X. How about a 120X mm. zoom on here, which is pretty wild. But the whole thing, it just has a... A unique look to it. It's really embracing the hump. It's all mm -hmm. hump. It's full yeah. hump. Yeah. And it seems pretty thick too, judging by uh, yeah. the side here. It seems like once you put the ultra designation on there, you are you can do whatever you want. Uh -huh. It can be fat, thick, hump, everything. Yeah. You can throw it all. You can put a screen in it if you want. But weirdly, and can I just say something weirdly? I'm attracted to it. Why am I attracted to it? Uh, it's a hump. I think it's because it's kind of science fiction-y. Uh, this idea of like an extra screen on the back. Mm -hmm. It feels uh, like one version of the future. Obviously not everybody's version of the future, but just, wow, they jammed a screen in the back. It's kind of a novelty factor to it. Uh -huh. And uh, and, it, I'm, and I don't mind a big camera hump. I've gotten kind of used to it at this point. So yeah. we'll see. The device should be dropping fairly soon and i think we're going to get our hands on it the official model not uh not the leaked one so yeah. we'll see how that maps out this one obviously floating around the web we all saw it wow meta humans create ultra realistic digital humans in minutes this is unreal engine this is epic this is oh i don't know will as far as the uncanny valley is concerned they're, they might be eliminating, I mean, that valley is not as deep as it used to be. Yeah, it's starting to become canny, right? Canny valley. Yeah. Wow. Um, I don't know if you say that like that, but I don't mind. Whatever sure, you say, yeah. Will. Whatever that means. They, um, but it's looking pretty good. They have figured a way to create a web interface where you can rapidly mock up a metahuman, a person with tremendous amounts of detail. And we're not talking about a still image here. We're talking about a legit, what would you call this in a video game context? I guess a character? No, you would have an, a model. Mm. And it's just the speed at which you can actually do, do this. At least, I mean, I know they sped it up in this particular video, but the speed and the detail, and then to see it come to life, we're going somewhere, man. Uh, I don't know how fast, but we're going somewhere. Yeah. This is something to it. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, am I am I am I exaggerating? I don't know. You. Uh, uh, no, they got a lot of things right. Um, it's usually the eyes that uh, create like a lifelike appearance, mm. um, and they seem to have. But but even like, the hair, even the hair the strand, hair, like that yeah, used to be a problem. The, like, the hair and the beard is more humanish. Um, the 
the tongue and teeth as well, mm. the way that they talk. Mm. Um, it's pretty convincing. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, and, and they could do it on the browser. You know, you don't need like a some sort of really crazy program. Yeah, like you can, I mean, for the record, you can GPU. tell you can tell that it's not a person. Like you know, but it's the cl- it's about as close as we've been. It's close. Yeah, this would be like the future avatar. If everyone's living online, mm-hmm. it would look similar to this. Where Did we it, talk about this before? What does your guy look like? like? Is your guy just you, like enhanced a little bit, or is it something completely different? I would say uh, that's a good question. Maybe both. Like no, 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 there's no. there's two. No, 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 no. no one no, was no. outrageous. No, and no, 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 no. Like, you only get one. That's it. Uh, I would go for outrageous. Wow. Something crazy. Wow. Yeah. So you sit at home, reserved Willie Do, uh-huh. but your digital, your digital is uh, off the charts. Yeah. Banana Town. Yeah. Crazy. Interesting. What about you? I don't have to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> CD Projekt Red got hacked, and then uh, mm-hmm. and then the information was auctioned on the yeah. dark web, and apparently it found a a buyer. It, they had a an auction going on with a buy it now of seven million dollars. The starting bid was around a million, and in order to even be eligible to participate in the auction, they were looking for 0.1 BTC upfront Bitcoin, which is equivalent to uh, $4,700 around there. Mm. However, they eventually cut a deal outside of that auction saying that they found some buyer that met their criteria. Now, what exactly was in there was the source code of the game, Mm -hmm. but then... They also said that there was some accounting information, uh, confidential, potentially uh, personal information, could have been part of it as well. And the developer said, we're not going to deal with this ransom. Yes. We're not going to negotiate any type of ransom. Mm -hmm. We're not going to partake. Because it started out as one of these ransom attacks. They say, we want X number of dollars to give it back to you. And they said no, which is how it ended up in the, in the auction status anyway. Yeah, they re- they they made it really prevalent. They tweeted about it, made a huge statement. Security experts analyzing the ransom note shared by CDPR have identified a hacking group known as Hello Kitty as the likely culprit in the ransomware attack. The same group was reportedly behind a ransomware attack on Brazilian power company CEMIG, among others, late last year. The raw source code for a game which is used to create the executable files distributed to players is usually considered to be among a developer's most valuable trade secret. Hmm. So obviously not good news. As as if CD Projekt Red needed any more negative uh, negative news. Holy moly. CPD, CDPR said on Monday that documents relating to accounting, administration, legal, HR, investors relations, and more were also taken as part of the attack, adding that we will not give in to the demands nor negotiate with the actor, being aware that this may eventually lead to the release of the compromised data. Crazy stuff. Terrible story. I don't know. Our people, I saw some people were talking about uninstalling the game and yeah. I don't know. I think this might have been a retaliation, you know, from the poor launch and the lying from uh, CD Projekt. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, there's obviously a lot of money involved here. There's a lot of incentive outside of any of that. But would these guys or, you know, these hackers would have done it if uh, it wasn't for the... I think they would have done it for $7 million. Yeah, Yeah. I think that that's an encouraging figure for them. But sure. I see what you're saying. As far as sentiment is concerned, it's fewer people feeling bad for them that were already upset. Yeah. I still I still do because, I mean, well, obviously, you wouldn't wish that upon anyone. And, and, and potentially, well, based on what they're saying, the information that was stolen, this could impact people that are kind of even outside, like as collateral damage. Mm-hmm. 
So that's unfortunate. IKEA has launched a bunch of new gaming gear in collaboration with ROG. And uh, a lot of it is kind of what you would expect. They got a gaming chair. They got a gaming neck pillow, which doubles as a headrest. They got a gaming cup holder, gamer mug. What's this thing? And they got a ring light, but this one caught my attention. The hand, the wooden hand. <laughs> it's gonna sell for around 20 bucks. And I like it. What? I like it. Don't ask me why. So do you put something on it? You do. Okay. You do. You put whatever, you could put a cable or a, a right. bunch of cables that you need access to frequently. You could kind of spool them around the thumb there. Okay. Uh, the way they show it off, if you scroll down a little bit, it's actually holding a cable and a pair of headphones. I don't mind the, the headrest pillow situation either, but like, look at the hand. <laughs> You're mad about that guy. The gamer multifunctional cushion blanket. <laughs> you don't know about gamers, Willie, do you? It's exactly what they do. I have no idea. You no. have no idea about these guys and girls. Um, uh, but you scroll down to the hand there and you see how they have the he headphones set up on there. You need a place to put those headphones. You need a cable to pinch. Uh -huh. You need an extra hand. You need a third hand. That's what you have now. Uh. And it's made out of wood, and wood is good, and I love wood. Uh. So it's got all those aspects to it, and it's only 20 bucks, but it showcases the fact that even companies that have been around for a while, like IKEA, are trying to capitalize on the gamer culture, which is taking off. Right on. Has taken off. The gamer culture has taken off so much so that the pigs are getting involved. I'm talking about actual, they're, uh, I'm talking about pigs. They're trying to get their hands on a PS5? <laughs> That's right. They're okay. in line. They are currently signed up to all the notification bots. Yeah. Study shows pigs can be trained to play video games. Pigs are really smart. I don't know if you knew that. A lot of people try to make the argument they're smarter than uh, your pet down there. A lot of people oh, say... I'm sure they are. <laughs> hey, man, you're supposed to try to defend your little Otis over there. Well, he's pet, a good boy, but... Pet you know. dog, yeah. So they uh, they trained these pigs to, well, basically execute this simple, relatively simple video game. It's still amazing for a pig. There's a joystick there. The pig has to push this tiny little ball on a video game screen to either of the walls, at which point a treat is dispensed, and the pig quickly figures out, hey, I just gotta quit. I just gotta push this joystick back and forth, and I'm getting treats all day. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so they, they, they actually train a number of them. And then with increasing complexity, change the location of the walls and things like this. And the pig figured it out what, where you might have some dogs that are just looking sideways. Yeah, they'll eat the joystick. Yeah, they might take a bite out of it. Yeah. You never know. And what's interesting is uh, this was a paper in the Journal of Frontiers in Psychology. This is, I, I, I presume, a relatively recent study at Purdue University. But I found this video clip online that looks like they've had pigs playing video games for a while because this clip looks old and it's embedded in a tech spot article. And if you head to, oh, I don't know, part way through, maybe around two minutes 40, you'll see a pig actually executing the task here. And it's kind of, it's, look, he just goes to the edge, gets the blue, gets the treat, <laughs> you know? And they had to set up this video game to deal with their vision because the pigs, they don't, you know, they have, uh, what is it, they're farsighted? Anyway, they had to create the contraption in such a fashion they could actually see what they were doing. But he pushes it, pushes it, boom, blue wall, treat, bang, let's go. <laughs> the guy's I like the guy in the background. Yeah, he's so Way happy. Way to go, pig. Look at the dog. The dog's got no clue. Dog's like, I don't know. Just pushing it any, any which way. Oh, he's playing too, I guess. What? But does he actually get the treat at any point? Let's see. No, see, he barks and... Where's yeah. my treat? Yeah, he's like, he's like, I normally just have to hang out with Willie Do and I get a treat. Yeah. Why well, I gotta play this thing over here? My treats come easy. Unlike the pig, the pig is, yeah, like I said, arguably more intelligent. They've done similar things with uh, chimpanzees in the past. Yeah. But they're starting to think, man, these pigs might be quite smart. Yeah, they're the future. I think Elon Musk was putting a Neuralink on a pig as well. Uh huh. Uh, speaking of the future, how about a Matrix style? Uh, battery tech. I don't know. Why did they say matrix style? Well, because you're plugged in. Oh, yeah, because the human is generating the Body power. The, yeah. yeah. Okay, so in this case, they figured out a tech, a wearable device that will convert your body temperature into actual electricity. Now, not a lot of electricity, but electricity nonetheless. Uh. 
this thing sticks to you. And uh, they're, they're the researchers that put this together at the University of Colorado Boulder. And this will fit maybe as a bracelet eventually. And the goal here is to create a wearable at some point that could be body temperature powered. At the moment, the actual effectiveness of this is around... It's in here somewhere. What is it like? You say it was five volts? Five volts for a device that size. It's like, but I, I remember seeing one volt per, I don't know where it is, one volt of energy for every square centimeter of skin space. Oh. So the more skin space, the more volts and so on. And of course, I was joking around saying, well, you're going to be exhausted. You wear this thing. I don't yeah. have that many volts to give up over here. <laughs> no, you're using maximum voltage. <laughs> Which is so dumb, obviously, because your body heat, that's there. That's freebie. That's there anyway. Uh -huh. So it is kind of cool. Uh, whenever you use a battery, you're depleting that battery and eventually will need to replace it. The nice thing about our thermoelectric device is that you can wear it and it provides you with constant power. I mean, it's a cool idea, but it's obviously not ready for prime time. Yeah. But it's a huge complaint I have about wearables and smartwatches, uh. battery life. Maybe the initial phase would just be contributing some amount of yeah. charge to, in order to extend battery life rather than to pull off the full charge. I don't know. Or what if like it charges your phone like very minimally if you are in a tight I don't think that I don't think that volt per centimeter is going to do very much for you, Will. Well, one can dream, right? You can dream. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you're fully allowed to do such a thing. India has warned U.S. social media firms after its ongoing dispute here with Twitter. I don't know if you followed this, Will, but we talked a little while ago about the uh, farmer protest going on over there. Mm -hmm. And Twitter is now in, in the mix because they have received requests from the government to suspend or delete certain posts, possibly accounts that the government claims are spreading misinformation about this particular ordeal. So Twitter's found themselves in the middle of it, and according to the government, they're not acting fast enough, hmm. and therefore they're being threatened. Indian Technology Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad warned U.S. social media firms on Thursday to abide by the country's laws a day after a face-off between the Prime Minister's administration and Twitter over content regulation. India said to Twitter on Wednesday, or actually they were mad on Wednesday, I guess they said it previous, they wanted the takedown of 1,100 accounts and posts that they said spread misinformation about the current farmer protests against new agriculture reforms. Man, social media and politics, it's complex. Yeah. But also converted. Did you see my hand? Oh my God. It's like, what is their responsibility? And of course, you had the whole thing in the US election and the Capitol uh, uh, when they storming. stormed the storming, the storming of the Capitol. Yeah. I forget what to call it, storm. And it was like, what stays up? What goes down? Who is in and who is out? And who decides, right? Is it up to the social media platform? Is it up to the government? And. So anyway, Twitter said that it had not blocked all of this content because it believed the directives were not in line with Indian laws. In other words, they were saying, there's no law to, uh, we don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. Show me the law. Where's the law? What is this? Indian government's like, well, we kind of make the laws. We'll figure it out. Like, uh, you're in trouble. Get on my face. Where's Jack Dorsey? Mm -hmm. That's how the meeting went. It didn't go like that. Anyway, uh... So they, there was obviously some degree of disagreement, but since then, Twitter has blocked access to the bulk of the accounts it was ordered to take down. You know, Twitter, they don't want to lose the whole, they don't want to lose access to that marketplace. Yeah. They're like, geez, man, we saw what you did with TikTok. Jeez, man. We're just, we're just, we're just trying to make a buck. Mm -hmm. Trying to do the right thing. I don't know if they're trying to do the right thing, but I'm saying that's the argument they would make. Now, they did not make this list public, which I suppose is possibly another problem, that there's a lack of transparency around what are these 1,100 accounts? What were these posts about? But 
the Reuters at least did notice that one lawmaker's account was among those that was geo-blocked by Twitter following the government orders. So this was the account of Sukram Singh Yadav, a member of the upper house of parliament. He was restricted in India after Twitter received a legal request from the government. His account has been restored now. He had tweeted using the hashtag Modi planning farmer genocide. Heavy. And this presumably would have been the hashtag or the sentiment or the language that would have caused the examination from the government and therefore the request. Presumably it would have been things in line with this type of language that they would have been targeting. Mm -hmm. But hypersensitive subject, tough spot for Twitter to find themselves, and increasingly this crossover between po politics and social media and the complexity in how these things are supposed to run and operate. Yeah. And same time, Twitter, a private company who has to who has the potential to 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 compete in that marketplace with other social media, homegrown social media that may be on the good side mm -hmm. of government and may have ways of benefiting through compliance or more expedited compliance with these types of requests. Yeah, it's a it's a, it impossible. Tough. It's an impossible Very spot. Complicated. Impossible complicated spot another area as far as technology con is concerned where the government of india is reaching is into crypto as we spoke about in the past it seems to be uh some new development there at least a little more texture around the story the indian government is said to be levying a complete ban on crypto investment hmm. stating that existing investors will reportedly get a three to six month transition period for liquidating their investments in crypto. They're saying, that's it, you get three, six months. Now, this is not official, I don't believe, at the time of uh, writing. This was reported on Thursday, that's yesterday, citing an unnamed senior finance ministry official stating that the ban won't be imposed overnight, probably so as to not cause panic, might get people buying more crypto in advance. I don't know. Tell you you can't have some. Talk about the Streisand effect. Talk about the internet. Talk yeah. about 2021. Yeah. The ban won't be imposed overnight, according to the official who said the government will get three to six months transition period. The uh, India's central bank currently doesn't back any cryptocurrencies. So this ban would be all forms of crypto as you know it, which it's not unprecedented. China has a relationship with crypto. They want to do their own. And they have also banned crypto to fiat transactions. Mm -hmm. What isn't banned in China is crypto to crypto. It's okay. But it's really interesting to see how this whole thing's going to map out globally as certain regions attempt to control this thing and whether or not the citizens partake or if they try to find ways to, to uh, maintain some type of uh, crypto investment holding or potential for transactions. Right. I don't know. But it appears to be is it a threat to these to these to these places quite possibly. Is it a threat to control and, and uh central power? Yeah, that's usually always the case, right? Everybody's worried about it. Yeah. Well, especially if you're in the center and you're powerful. Mm -hmm. as you might be one day will he do it could be you yeah it might be you banning crypto one day not yet but one day gamestop mania has highlighted a shift to dark trading it's another this kind of has a crypto tie-in in my mind uh you know the the robin hood blow up all the uh, various stock trading apps and the Retail investor, as you heard so many times throughout this GameStop uh, investing extravaganza. The way these sites work, Willie, do is these a lot of these transactions, they don't actually take place transparently on an exchange. It's private transactions. So when you buy something, buy a stock, let's say, on Robinhood 
or one of these platforms, at least in the case of Robinhood, that deal is being executed by companies like Citadel, who you kept hearing them come up on a Wall Street bets as well. They're looking for uh, transactions for their buyers or sellers, and they're skipping out on a, on a, a public exchange in order to do so. Now, that's existed for a really long time, but the question here is scale. How much of the market is uh, transactions are happening on the exchange and how many are in the dark? Mm -hmm. And this is where we get to this story here, a record. 47.2% of U.S. equity trading volume in January was executed outside public stock exchanges, which was up from 39% a year earlier. So big time increase over there, which is showcasing the move for the average investor towards these, these new platforms. It happened for the first time December 23rd and three times in January when off-exchange volume actually hit 50.5%. So actually more of the market volume taking place off the public exchange as opposed to in. So that's a significant shift right there. It showcases the... It showcases the uh, attraction towards the platform, but it also showcases uh, a possible apprehension, a possible threat to those investors that are buying off market or off the exchange where they're kind of they they maybe could be exploited maybe they are paying a price when buying or selling that is not actually competitive with the market mm -hmm. it's not since it's not happening publicly like what are the incentive structures here on the dark side on the dark side <laughs> There's a lot of play that can take place. You know what I'm trying to say yeah. here? Like the market, like the exchange sets the value publicly. Like we can all agree. We were just talking about crypto. Like the blockchain in that, in that example remains public for transparency. When these transactions are happening in private and the average stock traders are trying to buy or sell 50 or 100 things quickly, there, there could be slivers in there, slivers of margin. I don't know the legalities around it. So I'm skimming. But you have to wonder. Yeah. About leverage and and leverage and volume and, and, and where these transactions are taking place. So for example, that's something that takes place in the US. Here in Canada, all trades must be executed on exchanges. It's a it's a regulatory thing. So it's not like this takes place absolutely everywhere. Hmm. But I don't know that it's gonna slow down. And we may actually see an increase in this even more so as time progresses and as trading moves to the smartphone and as trading yeah. moves to the app. But it's not without its risk or consideration mm -hmm. that these deals, the back, these are backroom deals going on here at huge scale, massive mm -hmm. scale. Speaking of deals, massive scale, Elon Musk's brother just sold a bunch of Tesla stock. How about 119 million on oh. his recent trades worth of Tesla stock? I didn't realize how much Tesla stock he had. He often makes news strictly for selling Tesla stock. Oh, what does he do? You know, well, I guess he was an early investor, early part of the company. I think he has some other, he has a food thing going on. He's like, he's all about natural organic foods and such, I think. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Commu a family of community restaurant concepts. Colorado, Chicago, Cleveland, Memphis, and he's a big food guy. And cowboy hat. Okay, yeah. Food and cowboy I hat. I notice. I'll tell you that. All of his pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, big food and cowboy hat. Anyway, also Tesla stock. Yeah. Now, the reason people pay attention when he sells stock is because they think, well, he knows. He knows what's going on. He's, his, he's Elon's brother. And so if he sells, let's say, uh, over $100 million worth of stock, people say, should I sell my stock? Mm-hmm. They say, oh, maybe he doesn't think it's going to go higher than what it is right now. Maybe he thinks now's a good time to get out. Yeah, or maybe he knows something. Maybe he knows something you don't. So people always pay attention to such a thing. But there could be more to it. 
oftentimes these guys have uh, certain types of deals where they can sell and then buy back at lock in certain numbers. It can be profitable just to sell and rebuy in certain circumstances. But it's a tremendous uh, number of shares over there. He sold, by the way, uh, around 859, anywhere from 859 to $841. Wait a sec. No, that was the, the Tesla stock price. He, he sold for 850, 851, 852, 853. Uh. So all, all around that particular mark. And the total number of shares was what? A lot. How about that? No? Is that good enough? Am I allowed to say a lot here? After these sales, he still owns 599,740 common shares. Wow. Or about 0 0.06 of the shares outstanding. His remaining stake is worth 486.8 million. Maybe he just needs some cash for his restaurant endeavors. Sure. With the healthy food. You know the restaurants aren't doing very well right now. Yeah, he just needs to stimulate the He needs the 100 economy. mil for stimulation. Right. As you said. As far as the other shareholders in Tesla, you know Elon owns the most. He's got 18%. That's how you get those crazy valuations for his own personal wealth. Capital Research and Management Company has 5.5%. And Vanguard Group has 57.81 million shares or 6.1% of the outstanding shares of Tesla. Now, speaking of Elon Musk or the Musk brothers or Tesla, how about this weird story? Mysterious address with 3 billion in Dogecoin sends cryptic binary messages to Elon Musk. This is a very weird people there are people are speculating that Elon Musk might be in control of this 3 billion worth of Dogecoin in at one particular address. Hmm. All right. So let me just the the obviously we've been following what he's been saying about dogecoin on social media talking about going to the moon the people have spoken yeah doge and all the rest of it there is this address this one doge address billion dollar doge address that consumed over 20 percent of the entire supply since 2019 Think about that for a second. 30% of the entire supply of Doge at one address. Hmm. Worth $3 billion. All of a sudden, you're like, who, who, who could this possibly be? And you start to speculate, right? Then, a touch over a month later, after the address received its first transaction on February 6th, Musk said, Dogecoin might be my favorite currency, hmm. cryptocurrency. So people start to draw the connection. They say, yeah. okay, account opens up. It's his favorite cryptocurrency. Since then, that address managed to gather around 36.8 billion Doge worth $3 billion today. And in recent days, speculators have assumed that it might belong to Elon Musk. But then things get crazier because one person has tried to figure out that if, that if there's been binary, look at this next uh, thing here. People have been discussing the mysterious address. People have noticed that the owner of the address has been sending odd transactions, which can be transcribed into binary code. Can you read that one there? So this was a transaction actually sent to the wallet. Can you is, read what it says? Is I it T -Y. is it you, Elon? Oh. Question mark. That's what it said. Oh, but that's somebody sending intentionally sending it to the address, asking oh. a question via binary. One oh. person who tried to figure out the code said he couldn't translate it, and it was a lot of gibberish. Others discovered that one set of transactions displayed Elon Musk's birth date. Mm. <laughs> uh, other people are speculating the address might belong to the exchange Robinhood. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a lot of conspiracy, a lot of speculation. They even bring Elon Musk's uh, new son into the mix. Lil X. Yeah, Lil X. <laughs> Musk tweeted about the meme currency again. So, yeah, it's, I mean, look, somebody's got $3 billion in Dogecoin, and he's been very vocal about Dogecoin, so you have motive. Yep. Uh, and it's a fun conspiracy to try to travel down. But it is, it does bring up, it is interesting, like, the hype 
the hype money and and how social media and just the power of it right now has allowed like look at doge doge was dead Mm -hmm. and then the right people the right influencers say the right things and it's a completely different situation or i mean i guess gme was kind of a similar situation it's at 68 cents right now it's actually down a little bit today but still if you put like a i don't know a one year on it look at that like just a quick couple just the right people talking about it yeah so it does create an incredible opportunity to generate wealth unprecedented maybe it was point zero zero three cents. Yeah, point zero zero three. So imagine for a second like that you're a guy year. with the pro. I'm not suggesting this happened, but imagine you're a guy with the profile of Elon. You know what you say people do, and you just pick up some quick Doge, a bunch of it at point zero zero two, and you just keep tweeting. Yeah, it's the easiest work of your life. Mm-hmm. Seven tweets, three billion dollars. <laughs> you can't beat that. Yeah. So. There's a lot of incentive and motivation here, and it's a real a curious time to be involved in. And a lot of other people, like, let's be honest, even with 27% being in that one address, a lot of other people made money here too. Yeah. Bought and sold. Whether it's a crypto or, or a stock. It's, you know, the hype machine, full effect. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the hype machine, the Bitcoin one might be for real. Never mind Doge. The Bitcoin one might be for real because this article, wow, super promising for crypto. Bitcoin uh, MasterCard has jumped on a bandwagon. Now, they haven't said exactly what they're going to do, but they basically said, look, it's all about customer choice. We don't care how you want to transact. They announced late Wednesday they will support select cryptocurrencies. Here's a quote. Our philosophy on cryptocurrencies is straightforward. It's about choice. MasterCard isn't here to recommend you start using cryptocurrencies, but we are here to enable customers, merchants, and businesses to move digital value, traditional or crypto, however they want. And this is something I've been thinking. And I told you this before. I'm going around. I'm scanning. I'm buying things in the drive-thru. I'm just scanning. It's just data. We're just transmitting. And the if a customer really, really wants something, if the demand is there, if somebody's willing to switch companies, if there's money to be made, right? I mean, if you've ever been inside of these exchanges, people are making money just on you transacting. There's a huge opportunity because the demand is so high. Hmm. So if the hype is high and the demand is high, MasterCard's sitting on the sideline saying, why, what, why can't we be a part of it? Mm-hmm. And so they come out and make this commitment. Uh, the way that it will work is when someone wants to buy an item with crypto, MasterCard's crypto partners will convert the digital currency into traditional currency and then transmit that over the MasterCard network. So if you're wondering about value because of the volatility of crypto, it's just the conversion happens right at that moment, right? And happens over the MasterCard network. So merchants won't need to do anything extra in order to accept because they already accept the MasterCard. And this type of implementation, this is the way it gets done, Will. And I know there's crypto people that just, they don't like the idea of, or maybe they're not, I shouldn't say they don't like the idea, but they're, 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 they're passionate about the other elements and aspects of crypto, like holding it and... and, uh, and Cold storage. Exactly. The factors we've talked about Owning in the past. It. But this type of adoption or this type of move for the average person just immediately gets it into so many pockets gets the conversation started where it never was going to go mm-hmm. so i f- i think it's interesting uh you sent me this one the new porsche G- 911 gt3 touring spied oh no not the touring which article did i spend send you oh i spent sent you the touring one i'm gonna go back actually because there was they put out a, an official teaser i believe it showed at super bowl so they put out a video to hype it up the touring oh, model, one. by the way, I should mention, is is the more purest version of the car. It's they, it's uh, going to come out on February. The reveal is February 16th. Maybe we'll get one in the studio. I don't know. I'll talk to the Porsche guys. Uh, the touring model is the more purest version with the manual transmission and no spoiler on the back and super lightweight. But the regular GT3 has a wild wing on the back and uh, the PDK transmission. 
and they put out this little teaser video in order to hype up the Feb 16 reveal. The GT cars from Porsche, that's like the ra the real racing, lightweight, strip everything out of it, or at least a lot of stuff out of it. Get the weight down. Uh, this model is said to boast 9,000 RPM redline, 510 horsepower, which is an extra 10 horsepower over the previous version, and uh, 3, 000, just over 3,000 pound weight. Now, apparently, a lot of the work here was to meet the strict em emission standard that exists today for, oh, I don't know, 510 horsepower gasoline engines. Yeah. And so they were able to only do so much performance enhancement there, but for uh for the for the race type enthusiast this is uh it's the new generation cool. right so yeah the new generation porsche 911 it came to the other models first and then the gt models come later but uh, you go from so you had the regular 911 the uh 44s the turbo is out and now you have to have the gt3 and i guess the gt2 at some point either way a really mean looking sports car what what do you have to say well, about it? Yeah, it it looks uh, the fact that it's black. It's it's really nice, really sleek. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, anyways, uh, stay tuned for that. February sixteenth. Yeah. Last story of the day. Inside Edition has done the test that you've all been waiting for. Finally, I think we talked about this story twice. It was the uh, Subway tuna conspiracy that mm -hmm. there were was no tuna actually no tuna in the Subway tuna sandwich and there was a lawsuit filed in California in which uh, Subway was being accused of not using tuna <laughs> essentially in their tuna sandwich that it, that it had no tuna not any bit of tuna in it and of course Subway followed up and they said what are you talking about there's definitely tuna and they said actually we're going to give a deal to people who want to buy our tuna sub because mm -hmm. it's great tuna. Well now Inside Edition they go make a video and do the investigative thing and they send the tuna away to be analyzed the, from the Subway tuna sub to see if it's actually tuna. Yeah. And it comes back and they're like yeah it's 100% tuna it's just yeah. tuna in mayo and uh, what's wrong with you why'd you ask us to do this test you maniac of course it's tuna. And so I'm sitting there looking at this, and I'm like, what just happened to me? I just talked, I just did three stories about Subway's tuna sub, and you mentioned how it was going viral on TikTok. Yeah, the employees were literally just mixing up the tuna. And, and then I'm like, oh my God, it's a conspiracy inside of a conspiracy. The whole thing was a ploy, a fake lawsuit. To get us talking about tuna subs so that Subway could show off how tuna their sub actually was. Yeah. So Subway was all behind it. I, first of all, we're, I don't know any of this. And I have to put that stipulation. <laughs> I have to put that in there right now. Because yeah. I'm going to get my own lawsuit right now. Yeah. Saying that they engineered Subway's the whole thing. Coming for but you. I just don't understand. I really don't. I mean, they show the ingredients box. They show the thing. They pull the tuna out. They mix the mayo with the tuna. It's definitely tuna. Yeah. So what is this lawsuit? What is this lawsuit other than a way to get everybody in the world talking about Subway's tuna? That's not how it looks. Anyway. That's too much. Listen, too much. I am not saying that that's what happened. I got to make that abundantly clear. That, yeah. But it is interesting how things happen on the internet. It is interesting how these things transpire and you're, you're sitting there left wondering, like, what exactly was I just a part of? Uh-huh. What exactly? Who wins? Who loses here? What is this lawsuit? Was it ever real? Well, Subway wins. Do they? Yeah, I'm gonna go out and get a tuna sandwich right now. All right, there you go. 